Okay, we'll uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, again, we're pressed for time. Uh, the board's been complaining. We've been lasting too long in our meeting, so appreciate if we could move these right along and get out of here by 9. Paul's laughing. Please. <laughs> okay, first item, we have a presentation of uh, citizens' comments. <clears throat> Any citizens have a quick comment they'd like to make? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to, um, I came to BSD because I know that I, for one, as a parent, have been unprepared in venturing into the school year for a number of reasons. That's okay. <laughs> it's a little cramped for space. And um, I just wanted the BSD to recognize that due to the late budget, the impact it had in, in numerous on numerous issues. I know you are well aware of it, but it does, including, um, most recently I still don't have an understanding as to why BSD parents weren't given a bus schedule. Um, I'm not sure why that happened. It did not happen for me. I had to call, and even then I only got the pickup. I didn't get the drop-off time, so I waited for 45 minutes for my student to, to arrive at their bus stop, not knowing what time my student was gonna come home. These kind of challenges, I feel, are, um, again, uh, I feel unprepared to enter into the educational year. Um, my other student did not have a school schedule on time either due to a lack of staff being put in place and uh, staff availability for meetings and a variety of other issues. So I just wanted the board to um, hear from a parent that was deeply impacted by the late budget. And I hope that uh, there are plans in place to address all the issues that have uh, that have been impacted so that it doesn't occur again. Thank you. Thank you. I just needed to say that I'm concerned that there have been a lot of consultant fees being paid for, or just consultants have been brought to schools for suggestions as to how to do things, and staffing still seems to be an issue at the school. So I don't know why the board can approve funding for consultants when we can't even approve funding for paras or additional staff that might be needed to make specifically Bennington Elementary run better. I'm confused. I know that there's a new recess policy in effect that I've spoken to Jim Law about, and I'm confused why we need a policy like that when it's really just a staffing issue that seems to be keeping kids from being able to be watched better. And I don't know why consultants are brought in when we can't even fix staffing problems first. And I know my kid is impacted by that, and I know of other kids that are extremely impacted by that, and I, I'm just confused why we have money for, for that and we, we can't seem to justify having money to resolve staffing issues. And second to that is, I would just like, I know that it's number six on the agenda, but I need further information about the ASD team that has been approved for Ben L and or for BSD in general. What the purpose of it is and how that's going to what the ideas are about how that will get better, how this is going to make the schools better. I just need clarification because the new hires and the plans don't seem to add up to me. So if, I don't know if that's going to get touched on, but I just want that to be elaborated on further so I can be clear what that is and what that's doing. Thank you. Oh, Wendy, Wendy's here. All right, go ahead. Do you want me to do it now? Uh, yeah. It's part of the agenda. It's number six. Okay. Any other comments? I just had one other question. I'm not sure I'm allowed to comment or not, but I happen to notice on attachments to the agenda that we have staffing performing the same job, one at almost double the pay as the other. And I didn't know if somebody could elaborate as to why that might be, if it's the same position. That's all. With the homeschool liaison. With the homeschool liaison, you need to notice the difference in pay. You know what is the difference in pay in the homeschool liaison? Yes, I can, and I can tell you why there's a difference in the title. 
Um, actually, we originally, and principals can correct me if I'm wrong, but originally we started calling them homeschool liaisons, and individuals in the community thought it was homeschooling. So we've changed to school community liaison, so you'll see that we still need to be more consistent with that, that there's a difference on the agenda. The difference in pay is by um, background. Some of them have master's degrees and some do not. Some have master's degrees in social work and some do not. What, but if they're from the same job, why? I guess I'm confused. Uh, I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example. You can go to Mount Anthony. You can have a senior teacher teaching math one here getting 65000 You can have a brand new hire right next door teaching the exact same thing getting 35000 It's just where they are on a pay scale. It's, it, it tends to be part of public education's uh, experience. traditions, uh, experience and background tend to go for higher. Is this person being utilized for more than that position, or just the same job? Just the same job? It was 15 and 32, so yes. I think that just, I mean, the positions are new to the district in general. So no, they're not. No, they're not. Well, Claire, the one nomination hasn't been here for longer than three years, so the experience for the district isn't so much greater, while the education might be greater. I mean, it's more than twice the... Right. I understand where she's coming from because I had the same question. And that is that in one particular position, the there were seven applicants, and in the other position there was one. And the question that I was going to bring up was, why couldn't some of those from the seven be moved over to those with the one? And that was a question that I was going to bring that up in executive session if we had why? to talk about individuals. Why? But I mean, if we don't have to, then let's... Let's do it right I think now. There's a lot of dialogue about it, but we're moving from, in that one particular case, we're moving off of a contract and service to an employee. I know. Um, because we evaluated the position and they're really serving as an employee, so that's why we're encouraging it. I thought all the homeschool liaison people were 40% people, no benefits. 45. 45. So you're telling me now that there's not one of them is going to be on the contract? No, no, contract and service meaning uh, privately um, under a separate contract, not not the teacher's contract. Um, so we, I think it's confusing because people refer to a collective bargaining agreement as a contract. That's not what they're under. They're under, they're off contract, coming out of contract and services where you buy from a vendor, so they were a vendor that we purchased services from, and now they're being an employee because we went through the analysis of the position and realized they really are employees. They're not appropriate to be buying from them. But I have, a con I have a question in regards to that. If that's a contract of service, was it open to uh, applications? Was the job posted? Okay, then I guess my question is, is at Benel, we have, we have one applicant in one interview. For the homeschool liaison? For the homeschool liaison. Yeah. Which is really school. Okay, and at uh, Molly Stark, we had six in two interviews. And the one that got hired there is $15 an hour, but with the one in one is $32 an hour. Now, just, uh, I, I, my, my question being is, why are we paying the, the fee for the same I realize that she comes with more experience and she comes, but if, if it wasn't open, why wasn't that taken into consideration when it was hired? The, the employee at Bennington Elementary School was an existing employee who has performed her job well. An so, employee or a contract of service? Well, a, a contract of service who has done her job well. Um, so it was more a case of moving that person off of the contracted uh, service okay. venue because by the IRS rules, she actually was meeting all the criteria for an employee. So it was a case of changing that from contracted service to employee. It was not a, a, a full open advertisement because her performance was fine. There was, when the initial hiring took place, a number of p candidates who were interviewed, and that person was selected as the best candidate at that time. For the contract. Right, but, but shouldn't that have been, if that was going to move from contracted service to an employee, shouldn't that have been opened up to a public posting again of the position? My argument would be I have a good person who's performing well, 
Um, I want to keep that person. My argument as a budget person is that there could possibly be. But he said it was a limited posting. Yeah, I, limited posting. I, I, I don't know about the posting piece. I mean, I can't say that. I got no applications other than the person that we hired. So, but I don't know. You know, both what happened before that. They were posted by buildings. Whatever I'm going to with a master's in social work. Um, and we had one applicant that fit that criteria, was not a match. And so we went with someone without the master's degree that we felt was a match. In your contract of service. The person that's been out. Because it's both employees. Both employees. These are both employees. Both positions are employees. We can no longer use new. But the person that's been out elementary is the one that was with contracted service for the previous year? Correct. Yes, and the only applicant. And the only applicant. Is the person getting the same, they're probably not getting the same pay as they were under contracted services because with those deals, you pay X amount to the company and then they give half the money to their employee and they keep the other half to keep the business running. But you're ending up giving them what they were, you were paying the company, so they've got a, a more money in their pocket. In this case, there was no company. No, it was not a company. The person themselves were the, were the contractor. They were. And so, so, yeah, so, 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 so yeah, sorry, go ahead. We cut this position from, was it full time? It was 60%. 60 percent to 45. This person's definitely making less than he did a year ago. Yes. Oh, gross, yes. I don't have a problem with the less. What I got a problem is, is the discrepancy between having somebody that can do the job at 15 an hour and somebody that we're hiring at 32 an hour. So we should hire, we should fire all our teachers that are I making $60,000. I say that. And, say and that. hire the, Never said that. He didn't that say that at all. This well, question is absolutely he's saying, legitimate. He's saying that he had a qualified person that we didn't have a problem with, George, last year. But now we have a problem because somebody came ahead and and applied for a job at her school and hasn't got the experience, so she's getting a little less. The question they're asking for, Jackie, is clarification of what's going on, and there's nothing wrong with that question. And I think they've clarified it. Well, Tenor I don't know. I don't think it's... I, well, I don't understand it yet. Well, I think when you get... We'll take it up again when you get to... I don't agree with the where we are in public comment. We're all done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item, uh, treasurer's report for July, August to be posted. If you have questions, you can uh, get in contact with the treasurer. Budget status report been closed. Uh, you, should, you should move to accept the July report unless there is questions. Okay, can we have a motion to accept the July treasurer's report? So moved. Second call. Okay. Questions? All in favor? Unanimous. Yeah. Thank you. The okay. budget status was enclosed. Financial task list. Well, I got a couple. Okay. okay. A good question on the expense, the budget status report. I guess. So we're looking in at we're in September now, right? Yep. The, the window. So I'm going through, and I just did a, a, a brief scan of this. And just was looking at percent uh, remaining mm -hmm. column of this, mm -hmm. and you know there's some are still at 100, some are 80, some are 90. As I was going through though, there was a few that hit my uh, caught my eye that there's only 10 percent left, 5 percent left. Mm -hmm. um, so one is to understand some of that and some of those specific. But one that caught my eye that I was confused on was uh, the gasoline being at 10 percent. And then I see in there there's an incumbents. And I looked up the definition of that, but I don't know as to how we're using it here. Because when I looked up the definition, it was in regards to having a liability or a lien on some sort of an asset type mm -hmm. of thing. So I'm not sure how it's all tying together here. Yeah, the um, the blanket, what we call blanket encumbrances, we, you know, the budget is the budget that is you know, worked on by the board and approved by the, uh, the voters. 
and then we do uh, encumbrance, PO encumbrance, to um, estimate what our expenses are going to be based on the current information we have in time. Because the auditors want us to expend every dollar um, through the PO system. They don't want to go outside that PO system. So we do what's called blanket POs to encumber those dollars so then as money is used, you get, uh, you, you buy down that encumbrance for lack of a better purpose. So if you look at um, the year-to-date column, and then you look at the balance column, which is what the third from the right, that's your actual to date. Then your encumbrances come off of that. So the number I think you're looking for is in that balance column, not the budget balance column, which is less the encumbrance. But that's the accounting process that the auditors want us to you use spend it over time so that there's more accountability in how the money is spent as opposed to just paying an invoice at the end of the month. Is there a is, does it matter which ones are encumbrance, which ones aren't? I mean, is it just a, do you have a criteria of which ones you picked or which ones you don't throughout the budget? Because, I mean, like, I think, I don't know. I thought I saw a couple of things there. I don't know if it varies. Like, some things like under fuel oil or we, different we, things that are. That yeah, we may, we may not have, at this point in time, we may not have gotten to the point where we've encumbered everything. You know, especially if it's fuel oil, we haven't bought it yet, so we wouldn't <clears> necessarily <throat> price this to go encumber it. But prior to us buying it, because we need a PO in order to purchase that fuel oil, we will then encumber that money. Uh, the line items that are 5 or 10% left, typically pre-encumbrance, are typically those summer items, I mean, furniture that they're buying for the building for the beginning of the school, paper, books, those things, a lot of that supply stuff. The schools will uh, expend the majority of those budget dollars prior to school starting. Okay, financial task list from August 7th meeting. Um, I hope that was emailed out to everybody earlier today. Last I didn't get it. Here's, here's a copy. We got a copy. I can make copies. I can make copies. We got it. We have it right here. Just someone listening to that. Public just to uh, there were some questions at the last meeting, and uh, memo was handed out with an explanation of the questions, uh, an invoice, and then there was a vendor list that uh, someone asked for, and we got a vendor list. And then there's an example of a bid uh, for electricity, and it's example here is uh, for the board two bids, and uh, was given to the lowest bid. Look at the package of things. So the only question I would have, I guess, is uh, on the preferred vendor list. Is there, does it come up as a, that came up out of a purchase of some stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, um, a, it's an approved vendor list. I don't, I mean, I, Just these are people, it's not necessarily a vendor list of best pricing. Typically, they're the best pricing. I mean, we, you know, we, we often have vendors that knock on our door and say, you know, I got this desk I'd like to sell you. And they say, these are the desks we're buying. These are the price we're getting them at. And, you know, no, nah, I, can't, I can't meet that price. And so we don't bother putting them in our system. But if, there, if there's a qualified vendor that comes with, um, you know, good, good uh, material at good prices, Get a W9 from them and we'll put them in the system. But in looking over the list, you know, I, it, it looks to me like this is just a vendor list. Because, I mean, we've got a couple of representatives to the uh, legislature. Uh, we've got the, school, the Monument School in here. Um, I mean, this, this looks like just checks or, or vendors that maybe checks were made out to at some point. Um, 
Well, maybe I didn't understand the question. I mean, it is a vendor. It's, well, at the meeting that you were at... It's who's it, approved to be paid. Right, but at, at the last meeting, there was mention that there was a preferred vendor list. In fact, I yeah, think I Jim brought it up about purchasing some stuff. And he said there was a preferred vendor list, and I could be wrong by who brought it up. Okay. Yeah. But I think okay. that is the confusion, the word preferred as opposed to... Yeah, no. It's really an approved list. So there is no preferred vendor list per se then? No. And, and, off, and, obvious, and, and most of the time, how someone gets on this list typically comes from the building. So they'll say, hey, I want to order this book from this company. They got the best price. Okay. We get all the documentation. We put them in the list and the, and the building's ordered. Well, at that meeting was the first time we had ever heard of referred, so that's just a mistake. I apologize. No, no problem. Okay. The only thing that I would be curious about, you know, it's not the statute 16 on mm -hmm. over 15,000. Mm -hmm. Is there, you said that there's one in there for under 5,000 too? Or something? No. T typically we'll, I'm just trying to understand that. Typically we'll follow it, you know, for anything over $5,000. We're not required to. Okay. But, uh, we work very hard to get the best possible prices we can. Um, we might not do it in a formal bid process, but we'll go out and get three quotes. You know, if we're looking to, you know, if we're trying looking to buy these tables, you know, we'll spec a table and we'll go out to three or four vendors. And even though technically we don't have to do that. Can we, can oh, as well as, a, sure can we as a board, and I don't know if this is too, can we as a board, adopt our own bid policy if we wanted to, mm -hmm. we would have to go by this. In other words, if, let's say we wanted to cut the 15000 to 10000 mm -hmm. or we want a minimum of this, or, or so we could adopt our own bid policy if we wanted to yeah. for the bid okay. yeah. Any other questions on the package? <clears throat> if you're seeing on uh, letter D, 2015 budget planning, budget development related tech technology, Mr. Barnes. Hi. So, um, I'll stand for a minute, but I'm going to sit, and I hope you can hear me. My voice is, what my voice is. <clears throat> no, don't turn off the AC. <laughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I was asked to put together some figures on... Um, why don't you come up here, Mr. Barnes? Sit well, I'm, I'm going to need to do this. I'll come up here for a minute. Or actually, I can do this one. Can I sit here, Frank? <clears throat> so you can see. Uh... No, this is fine. Let me um, pass these around. I'm sorry I, I may not have enough of these for everyone. Because um, I try not to print everything. So if you don't mind sharing, sorry. Right? <clears throat> what we're doing is... We're going to look at where, where we are right now and where we think we need to be. Um, and we're going to cover a little bit of ground. I, I decided to, uh, to put this into a presentation. It's, it should be easy to read, and I hope it's easy to follow. <clears throat> if you can't, if I do totally lose my voice, I may call uh, uh, Sally in, in here to pinch hit. <clears throat> okay, so if you look at the first page, this is where we are. This is what we own. This is what's in each building. <clears throat> so there, there are five servers total for the BSD, 108 desktop computers, mostly used by, a lot of those would be used by teachers, and some in other locations. Thank you. I don't know if it'll help, but thank you. <clears throat> Frank, just a quick question in regards to, are these all workable units, or are these all able to be used right now as they sit? These are all, these are all um, working, but limping severely, and um, yeah. And there's some other issues that will come up that I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Um, we have 142 laptops and 175 netbooks, which essentially is a small laptop and not very powerful. Um, Windows tablets, <clears throat> and looking through uh, inventory, there were six Windows tablets bought quite a while back when we first got um, some smart boards for teachers. These are computers, laptop computers that you can walk around the classroom with and write, and write on the screen if you want to, which is a, a good way, you know, it's a handy thing to be able to do if you're using the, um, 
the smart board, but I don't know that anybody's using them, but we own them. Um, the Kuno tablets, <clears throat> this has raised some questions lately. Um, we purchased, uh, or you purchased, 170 Kuno tablets. Um, they're uh, expected to be deployed into the classrooms probably uh, late September or early October. The reason that it happens then is because curriculum law, the people who, excuse me, own Kuno, send, uh, I think, at least two, uh, maybe more, um, technicians and advisors to provide professional development for the teachers and to be in the classroom when the students get them to make sure that the students understand what's going on. So they send people from Indiana and they're here for a couple of days and um, it needs to happen when school's in session and teachers are ready. We didn't want to do it before map testing or during map testing. We might end, we might end up <clears throat> having them um, right at the end of map testing just scheduling those fifth graders uh, earlier in the, in the map testing scenario. Uh, teachers that are going to be using these have already received uh, one full day of training, one or two? Two. Two full yeah, days of training, I'm sorry, um, to get used to uh, the device and also to start building the what's called the loft, the curriculum loft. So these are, we own these, they're new, they're not in place yet, but they will be. <coughs> Smart boards, we have 44 uh, among the buildings, and to the best of my knowledge, they're all working great. Uh, teachers are using them. Um, one of the things that will come up later on when we go through some replacement things is, is uh, we have no idea at all how long they'll last. They might last another 10 years. They might break down next week, start going south. I have, you know, there's just no way of knowing. So when I put together projections for what we want to do to come, I didn't include buying smart boards in that, but I did give you a number so you, you know what we're dealing with. <clears throat> Projectors, most of those are going with the smart boards, but there's some, obviously, uh, there are 10 more than what there are for smart boards, so there are some that are portable or that are mounted in rooms uh, individually just for to project with, not necessarily a smart board projector. Document cameras, these are like, El uh, Elmo is a company that uh, people like, but there's a, um, a number of different companies. These are sort of like the digital version uh, of uh, overhead projectors. Um, only 16 teachers that we know of are using them right now. Um, this is the kind of a thing, though, that a lot more teachers might want to if they knew how to use them or if they, if they wanted to replace their, you know, their old clear sheets with something more you know, 3D and up to date. Uh, again, I didn't include, I don't think I included purchasing any of these in the future. Uh, printers, we have 69 printers that are mostly working. I think they're all working. But this is going to, we're going to be presented with a conundrum uh, concerning printers soon. And it's not just, um, gee, we shouldn't be printing so much stuff. It's that, <clears throat> how can I make this as clear as possible? The, um, when we upgrade the computers to the software that it has to have in order to do uh, run the SBAC tests and also to be compliant um, with, uh, oh, Sally, what is that with the, um, the health thing that happens? Oh, it, it's not compliant. It, health has to be compliant. It's uh, Windows, I'm going to be uh, Windows XP, which is the operating system for most of these devices, will not be supported anymore by Microsoft. So last time I spoke with you, I told you that that the SBAC testing, we were going to have to uh, get computers to, in order for uh, uh, the SBAC testing to happen, because that's not going to be compliant with um, X, uh, Windows XP. It's not going to be operational with Windows XP. But now beyond that, Windows has decided, Microsoft has decided, well, we're not going to support Windows XP after April of 2014. So we've got that. <coughs> the pro going back to the printer thing, a lot of these printers, many of these printers, won't run on anything after Windows XP. So if we upgrade to Windows 7 or Windows 8, we can't run these printers. There's no drivers available. There's no plans to make any drivers available. Um, so we have a printer issue. Um, digital cameras, we have 39. I hope people are using them. They're great. We don't need to buy any more. There's plenty of other ways of, of, of you know, the, I hope these are getting used. Um, but I didn't include them in anything we were looking at purchasing. Questions on this page? Oh, 
Thank you. Sally, would you would you do the honors of getting through the since I'm reading it off this. You know what? I'm gonna touch it right from here. Oh you it's a smart board, that's right. Go Sally. The board's smarter than me. It's not yes. oriented, but it's okay. You brought these the, the tablets last year. Yes. When there's issues, is there not an insurance policy on them to cover these things so that they are corrected and fixed at the time? The, the ones we bought last year are these Kuno tablets. Right. There is, a, there is insurance on those. But is, uh, from my understanding, there's issues with them? There's something wrong with them? And they're not there's wrong. nothing wrong with them. We haven't used them yet. Okay. Well, is it the computers that there's issues with? That um, the children go to use them and they're not working? There's, there are high fives. Connectivity issues. Connectivity issues. There are, and I'll address the connectivity issue okay. again in a, in a minute. There's every time you change something in the chain, and those printers are a great example of this. <clears throat> if I yell, my voice is better. <laughs> I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling toward you. Okay. <clears throat> every time you change something in the chain, you take you have a, a, a there's an. Uh, a possibility that you're going to change something else. The printers are a prime example. We have to upgrade beyond Windows XP. We have no choice. It just, it just has to happen. Once we do, these printers won't work. Same sort of a thing sometimes happens with the wireless. If the radio in the, in the computer doesn't give off the kind of signal that the wireless unit wants to pick up, then we need something to change a radio in the computer. Now, do we want to change a radio in a computer that we, um, the radio is the part that connects the, you know, the wireless thing, that, um, that we know we got to replace anyway. So we patch and band-aid and get things to run as good as we can as we're going through all these changes that are happening. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, Ken. <clears throat> Going on the tablets. Now, there was an interesting article in the Manchester Journal last Friday. Burton Burton has decided to give everyone their kids tablets as well. But yep. what they've done is they've asked each kid to bring in $25 to buy an insurance policy. So if the kid breaks it, loses it, stolen, it's going to be replaced. And, you know, they give them a case with it and everything else. They wonder, do we have anything like that in the back burner uh, to ensure that? Happens to these. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think that's if, if, if that's what it's going to take to get more um, tablets into individual kids' hands. This is something I've discussed a, a few times with you know, building principal of all Sioux and, and people at the high school at least. The, um, um, the being able to have that small amount from the, the students. And maybe there'd be a fund that could be put up for those kids who, you know, can't quite come up with the 25 or 50 bucks or whatever the insurance would be, would give us a, you know, a pool of money in case something happened that wasn't covered by insurance and, and all that stuff. You still want to cover everything by insurance. We cover everything. With an, we get insurance on every device we buy. That was my question. Yeah, yeah, we, we do. You can't, you can't do a deal when you change the computer or, or a smart tab so that because the printer doesn't match up, that they can't give you a better deal to be able to buy the two for the price of one? Well, you, well, I'm not sure what you mean. Like, say you're what? getting a new tablet because you've got to have Windows 8, and the printer doesn't match to the Windows 8. Why can't they give you a better deal to eliminate a printer and get the printer and a um, laptop that matches? Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't, we don't want the printer. You don't want the printer? <laughs> you're trying to eliminate them, is what you're saying? I am. Well, it's part of the bigger conversation that we'll get to about halfway through my presentation. You know, we really need to start looking at how, how things are done. It, it, you know, I, would, I just heard last night, I think uh, there's been a 16% drop this fiscal year, or the last fiscal, fiscal quarter was the fifth quarter in a row that's been a drop in sales of, of computers, of Windows operating system computers. So for five quarters in a row, the last one was either 14 or 16 percent. It's a steady decline where tablets are going up and up and up. Um, Android tablets, which is the platform that the Kunos rely on, work on, <clears throat> are 51 percent of the, of the market now, so more than iPads. Remember, three years ago was when we first heard of iPads. Three years. And now there's millions of them all over the place. Winooski just bought iPads for everybody. I don't know what Burr and Burton's doing. Uh, could be iPads, could be an Android device. I don't know. Enosburg High School, Enosburg, all schools. iPads one to one. Uh, if this is happening all over the place. So if 
there are no more questions right there, because I mean, this will come up again later. Okay. So now, flip to the next page, please. This is what I put together. I, just so you know, I had to use um, some um, real figures in order to get this to happen. So I, had, I went by this year's student count, okay? And I went by the most current prices that I had uh, on, on um, the, the equipment, okay? So we don't need to replace everything that was back on that first slide, on that first page. But we do have to do this. We need one, actually we need three servers, but two of those servers, the one at Ben L and the one at Monument, have already been, the pirates have purchased, my staff will put them together and get those in, in place. We still need to buy a third server. It's just way old and out of date and not reliable and, and we need to do that. So there's a server that we need immediately, uh, for lack of a better term. Desktop computers. <laughs> Almost everything, I, you know, I didn't do a, an actual count, I apologize, but there's probably maybe 20 devices total um, that have been purchased recently. Um, a lot of this is 2007, a whole bunch of it is 2007, so we're already six years, we're already, you know, beyond the expected life of a lot of this equipment. So I just, so I put figures for replacing everything that we have. This is just to maintain what we have, just to... We're not expanding, we're not buying anything new for anybody, we're just replacing what needs to be replaced within the next year or two, okay? So, desktop computers, we've got a total of 96,000 bucks. You've got to spend it. So that's a replacement of all computers? All of, yes. BSD systems? Yes. Okay. One for one. we got one, we're going to take one out and put all of them brand new. Exactly. Desktops. Desktops. Desktop. Desktop. Is that how all of these are based on? Is all yes. the formula you have is yes. completely replaced? Yes. Because I, I wanted to give you a, a sense of what, if we were just to do exactly what we've been doing and we had to do it today, this is what it would cost us to do that. Um, I mean, there are a, a few computers on here we could limp along again, and like I said, there are a few devices that we could we get another couple of years. Yeah, no, no, I'm just saying. Well, the thing is, I, I know you're not going to be happy because I know how, um, how focused you are on trying to keep the budget under control and take care of this, you know, the citizens and, and still provide the education that the kids need. So I understand all, all those elements. And then I start looking at big numbers and I say, well, it's what it is. It is what it is. Um, laptops and netbooks, I, I put these into the same category because, as I mentioned earlier, they are essentially the same thing. Um, we've never would buy another net, uh, netbook. Uh, it's just not anything. You know, we had, we had them, we used them, we got some use out of them. They're not pedagogically strong. They're not, they're not, uh, it's technology that's passed. Okay? <clears throat> and there was definitely, we can't even manage those in the enterprise, the netbooks. We can't, it's, they're all home systems and, and we can't manage them at all. So there's another $190,000 there. Projectors, if we were to replace those projectors, <clears throat> um, $43,200. This is a thing where the projectors, again, they're working. They were bought from like 2002 to 2011. You know, they're, they're very went in there. I just want to, I put the figure there because I want us to be aware that, you know, something might need to be replaced. Not necessarily, we're not necessarily going to spend $43,000 on, on projectors. But um, something to keep in mind uh, is the cost of projector bulbs that is pretty steep for, some, for most projectors. And there are new technologies now that have projector bulbs that last, oh, my math isn't so great, but instead of 4,000 hours of use, you get 20,000 or 30,000 hours of use. So that would be a, you know, a savings if we were to upgrade to something like that. The projectors are the smart boards? The smart boards are this, not smart boards. <clears throat> These are all, all the projectors. This is all the projectors just because it's a crapshoot as to which ones will work next week as opposed to next year. Is a smart board considered a projector? No. No. It's just this part is the projector. Yeah. So. Smart, when I give you the smart board prices, that's without the projector and projector prices are separate. And then printers, finally, and we know if we're going to print, this is what we're going to spend. Okay? If we're going to continue to print, um, we know we need to replace most of those printers, so that's what it's going to cost. Questions here?
Right. Well, one of the things that's that's taking place is that printers can um, print to the um, to the copy machines. So that takes some of the printers out of the loop. But there's still a lot of teachers who prefer to print to a printer, have their own printer, <clears throat> pardon me, or, or departments that have printers. But in general, it would be nice if we looked at a different way of sharing information rather than printing it on paper. There's always going to be a need to print stuff on paper, but there's probably about 80% of that could go away if, the, um, if other things came into play. But this is a teaching practice thing. This is, a, this is beyond spending money on a printer. So I, I, I'll address that maybe a little bit too. I don't know if that'll help either, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> the higher I, I can sing, <laughs> you know, real, it's, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> I'm in the mood for love. <laughs> See, I can sing. <laughs> the hills are alive with the sound of mucus. <laughs> oh, no. oh no, and I'm on TV. You're on TV. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, down at the, bo <laughs> at the bottom of this page, I just put a little note down here. I didn't include it in the budget at all, but at the bottom of that, that uh, still there, yeah. Um, if we were to replace, um, if we were to get those tablets that I talked about earlier that teachers could walk around with and write on for the smart boards, <laughs> if that was something that became a norm in the practice, then to do that with a Windows tablet computer would be uh, that extra money. I didn't include it because... Frankly, I don't know of anybody who's asked for that. Uh, it, is, it is a standard practice for some people, but it's something that you'd really want to, you know, get used to doing and get a little training. Okay, now I'm flipping over to some things to consider. <clears throat> okay, replacement cost of a smart board right now is $1,299 bucks plus shipping. That's just that, the board. just the board, okay? Um, the, uh, just so you know, I didn't put it on here, but a projector, prices really vary on projectors, but 800 bucks, <coughs> generally 800, 1,000 bucks, you can get a really good, for 1,000 you can get the ones with the forever light, you know, uh, light bulb. The document cameras that I mentioned, earlier that uh, a lot of teachers seem to like, uh, or some teachers seem to like, and I think others would like to try that. If that was a consideration and, and all the teachers, or you decided that you know, that would be a good thing to put in the classrooms, for 69 bucks each, it's not all that, not all that bad. Uh, projector lamps. <clears throat> this is really a lowball figure. I, um, I had Ann look up prices today. And this is what I got, was between 100 and 250, depending on the projector. Um, that's gone down considerably if these are really the prices, and I apologize that I didn't uh, have time to really um, vet that. But even at, even at that, the, one of the reasons that it's between 100 and 250 is because we have a whole bunch of oddball projectors. We don't have, we, it's not like we, like with laptops, we buy Lenovo. You know, we get the same brand, you know, pretty much across the board unless somebody has a special purpose for something else. But with projectors, for some reason, we ended up with a mishmash of a whole bunch of different kinds of projectors. So it, that also makes it difficult to keep any kind of um, stock of light bulbs because everyone's got a different bulb. And it's just, uh, it's not the, the best plan. So if, and I guess that's partly why I uh, put the uh, projector price on that previous page. Mm -hmm. To the printers, Main cartridge for each printer is another 69 bucks. So on top of the price of the printer itself, you, know, you get 69 bucks every time you switch that out. This goes back to your question a little bit about the um, connectivity. I'll try to explain this in uh, <coughs> layman speak as much as possible. This is our access point up here. This is where, where our wireless signal <coughs> connects to your computer. 
Um, you probably, if you've done any shopping at all for a laptop or something, you know, it says uh, um, that it has uh, A, B, G, and N um, for, uh, what's that called? Sally, my brain's, uh, what, the uh, or mic. What's that? Wireless adapter. The card. The wireless, yeah. The radio frequency. Radio frequency. <clears throat> so, all of the mangroves that we bought, which are cream of the crop when we bought them, in 2011, two years ago, 2011, Rick, I think, beginning of was it 10? Could be. Okay. They have they have, they have G radios in them. Now, if you were buying a laptop today, you'd be you'd be looking for N. You'd be looking for an N radio. Much less interference. Much more reliable and staying connected to the to the machine. Um, and soon there's going to be um, an AB radio. It's called AB, which will even be more robust. But right now, state of the art is N. All of our radios are G's. <clears throat> That's exponentially about six times less uh, effective, I think. It's, it's uh, significant. We can update these. This is, and this is what kind of kills me, too, about a, a number of things in technology, and I'm sure it doesn't make you happy either. These have N radios in them. Okay, but we don't have licenses to use the M radios. Okay, we got 51 of these things, and the license is that price, 300 bucks a license to be able to use it as an M radio. Okay, and then if we updated that to be the what's current right now, <laughs> February comes, the AB system comes out, and now we're still one step behind. So uh, we can we can continue to to deal with what we have, and some of the problems would be solved replacing some of the other equipment, because those old netbooks, for example, especially in the old Netslink laptops, do not like to connect to this. The radios just don't want to play nice. So with new ones, they'll play nicer. Well, that's not Comcast. No, 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 that's not Comcast. Okay. How much would that cost to replace? <laughs> um, well, uh, you sometimes paying for the license oh, yeah. is almost the same price as buying that. Yeah, you know, it probably would be cheaper. Well, I don't know about cheaper. Since these came out, and since more and more schools and, and businesses have gone wireless in their own enterprises, a whole lot of competition has come along, so that has driven the price down in general for the mm -hmm. units. Um, I'd have to look into to pricing. Jackie, to give you give you something realistic, but I know that there are other systems that work slightly differently for less money than what these are. Uh, I don't know if it would be worth, and especially since it's a shame they're new. You know, I mean, really, for all intents and purposes. Well, I'm not. I wouldn't advocate for garbage anymore. I'm not. Just oh, yeah. that if it sometimes it's cheaper to buy something brand new than to pay for these licenses constantly. Sometimes, yep. not very often. <laughs> okay, so now I want I wanted to read something. Um, it's short, and I want to show this video because now we're moving into happy land. You know, where should we be going? Should I do this or should you do this? Oh, this isn't going to play. I'll ask Grant. Well, then I'll read this. Yeah, more reason. Um. You want me to read it, Frank? <laughs> Frank, you want me to read it? That's okay. The device didn't work. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I hear that a lot. You know, it's and you know why? Because it wanted to an update, and I haven't been on this computer for you know a couple of months. And I never used Firefox, which I had to use to get to there. And it wanted an update, and I didn't update it because I didn't. Add it to the time. <laughs> yep. These, these things need to be maintained. Um, the challenges we face in providing the best education for our students are many and varied. It often appears that laws, regulations, and mandates drive our actions more than students' needs. This is the world we live in, and it is our responsibility to respond in a proper, legal, and ethical manner. 
Included in our response is the way in which we address the technological needs of students, teachers, and administrators. I hope to shed some light on what, me on what that means for the BSD. As we address the requirements passed down from our state and national leaders, we must also refocus and revise our vision on what it takes to provide the best education possible for Bennington's children. The once narrow field of technology has, ta has overtaken much of how we do business in schools. From data management to new and emerging teaching practices, technology is everywhere. The BSD should be commended for being at the forefront of bringing technology into the classroom, implementing netbooks and laptops to give more children increased time with computers, and adding smart boards as tools for teaching and learning. New technologies and changes in teaching practices need to go hand in hand. We need good teachers, not necessarily new gadgets. But new gadgets, tools, and ways to connect and create will continue to come our way, and we all need to know how to adapt to the changes that will follow. Mobile technology makes it possible to learn anywhere, anytime. Moreover, it allows us and our students to create, publish, and share content through mobile devices. It is critically important that education leaders understand this paradigm shift and find ways to embrace it. I know it may sound trite, but our children's future truly does depend on it. I really believe this. You know, that's why I bothered to write it. Um, we're in a different world. Our kids have different needs. Um, if we were looking at just the things that are being told, we're being told what to do, then we can look at um, the Common Core State Standard of um, Writing 4.6, which states that every student will uh, create and publish um, uh, content on the internet um, and there's a whole bunch of other common core standards that also include technology and its use in the classroom. We can look at the SBAT testing that they'll be taking on computers. They don't, have a, they don't have an option. The test is coming. I'm not necessarily an advocate for basing everything on what the test scores say and I wish we could all move away from that and, and see what successes kids achieve uh, in many other ways other than what they get on that, pay, on that test score. Um, but we, we need to pay attention to the changes and address them. We need to comply. Um, the, um, we, have, we have no choice but to comply with the, with the law, but even more morally and ethically, we need to focus on our kids more, and this is what they need to do. And that's my spiel before I go into ways to address some of this one-to-one -one scenario. By the way, the one-to-one -one tech plan uh, first showed up in the, in the BSD and the SVSU with Jim Bhutan's uh, uh, tech plan. It's, it's in there all over the place. It continues to be in the current tech plan, which has been approved by the state to move towards one device per kid, you know, at minimum, actually. Um, so these, this isn't something new, and it's not, and it's not cheap or free. So, oh, uh, can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Maybe? Okay. These are possible ways of addressing a one-to-one -one scenario that I want you to consider. Um, one way is through using Google Chromebooks. When I first introduced teachers to Google Chromebooks about a year and a half ago, when I first took, uh, took over this position, they fell flat with uh, on response from teachers because some things could not be done on the Chromebooks that could be done on computers. Um, I, you know, that's kind of a that's an excuse that a lot of people give. But you know, here here's something I thought of while I was sitting here. I can write with this, and I can write with this. I can write with this on that, but I can't write with this on that. I can write with this all over the wall and vandalize it and get in trouble. I could with this too. It doesn't matter what you're using, you know, and, and sometimes things have different purposes. It's knowing how to use the right tool for the right thing becomes important. So Chromebooks were looked at with a uh, sort of a scant because they couldn't provide, they couldn't do compass learning. Students couldn't do compass learning on Chromebooks. That is no longer the case. Now they can. The middle school is piloting um, 150 Chromebooks this year. They did a lot of research and they decided to replace their netbooks with Chromebooks. 
So that's why Chromebooks are on the plate here. The cost of Chromebooks is very, um, pretty low comparatively. So if you look at this, and what I did with everything, folks, was I looked at a four-year plan because the message that I got was you wanted to look ahead a little bit, not just like what do we need next year. So if we were to, if we were to add two grade levels a year, that's what this represents. If next year or whenever we put a plan into place, we just did the fourth and fifth grade, okay? And then the following year, we did the um, second and third grade, and the following year, K-1. Uh, in three years, everybody would have something, okay? Uh, this does, and again, it's not just the gadgets. I've got to emphasize that because it also means professional development has to occur before anybody gets anything. Teachers need to know what they're doing with this stuff. And there's a lot of opportunities for that to happen. And that's a bigger discussion in another, another day. So year one, we buy for 83,000 bucks, fourth and fifth graders that have these. Following year, 90,000 bucks. And I went by the current numbers. You know, I just had to use our current numbers. Um, that's what it would cost. So after, in the fourth year, everybody owns them, so we don't have a, there's no cost in the fourth year. So for the four years, $269, uh, $269,288. Now, to really make these be, ramp these up, if we went to a virtual system so that this eliminates, again, I want, I want to make it clear because I, I understand that things that I understand in my head might not be um, obvious to a, lot of, to a lot of people. Um, one of the reasons Chromebooks are inexpensive compared to computers is because they don't have a significant hard drive. They don't save the stuff on the computer itself. Mm -hmm. It has to get stuff in the cloud, right? However, if we, virtual, if we virtualized our system, essentially what that is doing is it's, we're creating our own cloud. That's one way to look at it. So in order to create our own cloud, that not only the Chromebooks work perfectly fine in the cloud. That, that's fine. And you can do SBAT testing on them, and you can do the whole, the whole nine yards. But if we had virtual, uh, virtualization, you could also run uh, uh, Windows apps on it. You could run Microsoft Word. You could run um, anything that you can run on a computer. Because what it, was, what it becomes is just a receiving device for the computer that's sitting over there that's giant and has all of the stuff on it that it needs and all of the individual devices share the licenses. The cost, by the way, for virtualization, most of that is licenses. A lot of, a lot of paying for licenses. Still, Chromebooks with <clears throat> virtualization, roughly $400,000. Now something that's gonna be true of, I'm gonna give you two more scenarios. I'm gonna give you an iPad scenario and a Kuno scenario. <clears throat> and what's true of all of these is, if you look down at the bottom of, this, of that sheet, it says reduced by 190375 That's because no matter what you do, that's how much you've got to replace on that first slide that I showed you. That, those, so anything that I'm showing you here replaces that. So you can reduce that. So now we're down to 208000 bucks over four years, which is uh, pretty doable. Not... That's not the total cost, though, because all those other things on that page, you know, if you're going to get printers, if you're going to have smart boards, for example, I mean, this is just the individual one-to-one -one devices. Okay? Everybody good? Mm -hmm. Any questions before I move on to the next? Big, scary ones next. Okay. Frank. Frank. On the prices, there, is there a factor that's put in there for the, the technology that's changing almost monthly. You know, you know, George, that's that's such a, that's such a, a, a challenge to try to stay up to date on what's happening. Um, what it is, I guess, the only way I can say that it does address that is that this is um, using the most current thing that we have that's possible to purchase today. You know, I, like I mentioned earlier about the sale of computers going down. You know, personally, I believe much more is going to be going on in the way of tablets. I think more tablet computers are going to be getting used. 
yeah, you want a keyboard sometimes, that's easy enough to arrange. But having that mobility, having something you can take home and, and, and work with at home and create stuff, communicate with people, take pictures, take video, make a book. Do, I mean, it's just, it, it goes on and on. So I, I truly believe that tablets, whether they're iPads, you know, that are this big, or the phone in your pocket, you know, which is another fancy tablet, um, is going gonna, is gonna to be used more and more. That said, there's still going to, for a long time to come, there's still going to be plenty of need to have full bore towers and, you know, hold, load all your budget sense software on there or whatever. And No, you don't, you don't want it on there. <laughs> right, so we'll need those computers. That's what I'm saying. We'll need, the, we'll need those computers for something. Hey, yeah, would you... I have one other question. You have, um, you have year four on the Chromebooks is zero. Yes. Wouldn't we be repurchasing? Because these things go out of date. Yeah, but we wouldn't repurchase in year five because I'm on a four-year plan. Okay. So, you know, I, I look at a four-year plan. And the reason I looked at the four-year plan, second Kelly, was um, that's what Apple offers a solution. A number of companies offer a four-year solution. Okay. So that's one of the reasons. And that's also, like George just mentioned, four years, God knows what we're going to be using in four years. That's yeah, true. Yeah. Well, it kind of follows up with that. I mean, like the Chromebooks with a three-year plan. I mean, are Chromebooks still going to be in date in three years? I guess my point is if we start year one and we get Chromebooks, and the following year, okay, well, hey, Chromebooks isn't the answer anymore. <coughs> you know, I understand the plan, but, and, and I know there's no insurance to make sure that's there, but how do we address making sure that Chromebooks is where we're going to be and lock into three years and make sure that in the fourth year, we don't have to replace everything again? Yeah, let me, okay. That's a great question, Kelly, and, and that begs for me to go a little sideways here and, and talk about the need for, you know, BSD needs to have a tech committee of its own, or the buildings need to have one that comes together and feeds into the SBSU tech committee, because there's some dis decisions that need to be made, and your voices need to be heard on those decisions. So we need, so we need to know the direction that you're going. But also, we need to find a way to prepare teachers, I, I'll sound like a broken record from time to time, teachers to effectively include the technology that's available in their teaching so that students get the maximum uh, benefit from, from that use. So professional development, the curriculum department, it comes, becomes a huge part of this. A lot of school districts are actually combining their curriculum in their tech departments because they're getting so closely you know, uh, married these days. So. To specifically on the Google Chrome thing, one of the beauty, one of the selling points, I guess, of, of Google Chrome is, uh, and Chromebooks is that you never have to buy updates because they promise to constantly update it. You'll always have the latest version. They update it from the cloud. So there's no, like now we're going through this Windows XP, switching to Windows Pro, you know, 63 bucks a license times 3,000 computers or whatever. I mean, you know, it gets, it gets outrageous. So their, their promise is we're not going to do that. Other things that get promised, and some of the, I mean, I, I'm very hopeful that a lot of this will happen. I'm sure you've heard of Khan Academy. I think you've heard of Khan Academy. It's just a, you know, it's a series of lessons in it started out in math but it's grown to take in sciences and history and I, I don't know did anybody see 60 minutes Sunday because I think uh, Sal Khan was on there and said I will never ever ever charge for this service you know for this for this part I think you can pay a fee for a dashboard to control things and things like that but more and more things are going to be available that are going to be updated and are going to be uh, there's going to be no expense can, are, we, are we able to take advantage of that? Are we able to access that stuff? Google tells us they're going to constantly update their, their, their software, and we'll constantly be able to get whatever's the latest. I have to just take it on faith, I guess. Um, yes, Catherine? No, I just want to, um, so just specifically on the, the Chromebooks, but where does that stand with that virtualization piece, the part that makes the cloud? You know, you said that that, that will, 
that's what we hope with, with wireless, but that only goes to end. We got to get the AB in February. So, you know, like what's what's our what's our uh, assurance or insurance there? The, yeah. <clears throat> well, that, that's one of my, my not quite so favorite things. With the virtualization scenario, the reason we have those figures there is because they constantly are going to charge us for licensing. It's like a Microsoft scenario. They'll continue to update it as long as we continue to pay them money. But we're paying them a heck of a lot less money for to update the cloud, so to speak, than to update every individual machine. Um, it's... And, and, and then you bring up another good point with the, uh, the wireless connectivity. The more robust that is, just the better everything is going to operate. So, um, by the way, I th think you're all aware, we just recently bumped from 100 megabits up to 300 megabits. We just tripled our bandwidth um, at the end of the summer. So there's a lot more available. I haven't heard too many complaints about that yet, but we'll see. <laughs> Uh, questions before? Yes, well, I just want to come back to um, the technology committee uh, because that's later in the agenda. We can take care of it now. It's Frank um, brought it up. We have had a continuing uh, technology committee at Mount Stark and a couple of the other schools. Um, what we need to do is come together with a BSD committee so that we can continue that one, uh, one district, three campuses, so that they, uh, that committee will then feed into the so I've spoken with each of the principals about getting that together. Jackie will be on that BSD um, committee as your no? <laughs> well, I had this conversation with Frank. The committee that Claude was on was a short-term, check these devices out type of committee. It wasn't really the tech committee. There never was a real tech committee. It was always a committee with teachers. Yeah. Um, you know, discussing how to teach and how to use the, um, the devices. So when you guys put me on a committee, there really wasn't a committee to put me on. Well, you're not a yeah. You're a committee of what? I think we're in the cloud. Years ago, there was board representation on the committee, and I think it just came as an assignment. But it's something to consider, and I think what I would say to you is, you know, we can start working with the schools, and then you all can consider. You've got a lot to think about here. This is the first piece of the budget discussion, and really listening to Frank about where you want your vision to be for your students. You'll have another budget work session that this will become part of the information we'll be discussing. I guess I'm hoping that this is the start of, I mean, we'll need more than just this because of this only is the Chromebook and virtualization. You, got, you know, does the virtualization take, is that replacing the wireless piece of it as well? The, the printers that we're talking about that we want to get away from? I mean, there's other components here that we need to know the value of and what is, what what's your preference of, of phase in for getting that, keeping that stuff up, up to, getting it up to date, but at the same time, the only thing, I, I understand the Chromebooks with them updating that, but I'm looking to see the replacement end of it as well as the maintenance end of it from the standpoint that at the end of so many years, they may update the software, but the hardware's no good. The, the book itself can't take the update, so you gotta, you need a new, you need a new Chromebook. So there's gotta be a certain amount of information out there, something that will tell us that we should be budgeting X percent of a budget for IT purposes. Um, Just to maintain, because if you said that, as far as you know, most of the smart boards are there. I know of one that was broke for quite some time, all of last year. I will check on it to see. Okay, that, let me know. I will, but you know what I mean? Because whether it be from a, you know, it, it, was, it was it was purchased too long ago. You know, I just want to make sure that we're going to have a plan beyond just the one to one, and that we're we're building into our budget the maintenance. To repair because everything, not nothing lasts forever. It's not going to last a lifetime. I mean, so we've got to have some sort of educated guess to know what should be in there on top of the actual replacement cost of, or you know, put, present it in a way that says, "All right, your replacement cost of this hardware and these items is this because of you know these different pieces." That's what I'll be looking. That's what I'm hoping that this will evolve into. Well, uh, and yeah, I, and it, you're right. We need to. We need to keep our eye down the road to know what might be coming. So it's not just what technology might be coming, but also what the expense of that technology might be. 
it's really hard to predict, but we can, you know, Rick has a, you a, a your system. Own system. You can Google what's best practice for budgeting for IT expenses within the corporation. It's out there. You can go out there, there's plenty of research, I'm sure there's information that will tell you that best practice for budgeting on a budget for IT expenses for the future, here's the recommended based guidelines or whatever. Well, that's also a question that I can ask. You know, tech directors and technologists in the, uh, in the state of Vermont are really pretty tight, and we communicate every day. There's a there's a listserv that goes out, and people are asking questions left and right. So I, I would ask them first, and then, right. yeah, but and then. Reason, I, mean, yep. I know that within our organization, we've got to build in so much <coughs> expense for IT for whether they, you know, you know, servers are going down, you get a new server coming next year. If you're staying with desktops, we've got to X of many that are going out. You know, I mean, this is the foundation to eliminate some of those desktops so you don't have so much hardware that you get to do, but there is going to be some sort of an expense to maintenance and repair. I mean, that's, that's going to be no longer. And also standards for um, professional development, too. Right, that's mm -hmm. the other picture that you mentioned that you know, we'll have to get added into this. What is that expense yeah. for? And that features? would be, and, and be at the SU level right. as well. Yep. I think this is great, by the way. Question for you. I mean, is everybody in the SDSU leaning towards the, and the reason I ask this, I noticed in last month's SDSU warrants, it was $14,000 spent on iPads. So my question is, is where are we in purchasing now if we've got to update a lot of stuff? Now, I realize it may not be BSD. But are we going to be running two separate systems? I mean, are we going to have Apple in the high school or Apple in the middle school, and then we're doing this? I mean, where, why are we spending fourteen thousand dollars on iPad stuff if we're not going to steer towards iPad? Yep. <clears throat> there are a number of factors that play into this, Kelly. One is, <clears throat> I believe that fourteen thousand dollars was early childhood. <clears throat> so all of the early childhood ed teachers had training in how to uh, use the iPads with their students. <clears throat> More so, for the capacity of the, the device to assist with the lower students in the communication skills level, mm -hmm. for the staff, and also get them so comfortable that they'll use it a lot with the students because we know that's an effective device for young children. Lots of apps for children with complex disabilities, communication devices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. And I just want to make sure, and, and that I agree with you 100. But my point is, is I just want to make sure that we're not throwing band-aids over something and right. buying pieces and spending money when let's look at the you know the overall picture that yes and, well, and <coughs> last year at the high school they bought one classroom of iPads, one classroom of laptop, one classroom of Chromebooks, and then the other one the kids brought in their own devices, phones and so forth to use. And I don't know if that was a right. test scenario to see which yeah. one works better at the school or what. It was a no yeah it was you know, I'll try to be succinct, but yeah, I, I was this could be a huge conversation. What drives our decisions in any of these things? Like, it, some gadgets are better for some things than others. iPads work particularly well with kids um, who have autism. There's a whole lot of practice and, and best practices to use using iPads. I'm not aware of, but we have a guy who you know, does that. Um, iPads are also if you're gonna if the t if the teacher is including you know holistic teaching that includes um, you know uh, really individualized instruction where a kid expresses themselves better through music or through making a video these kinds of things iPads are ideal for that it doesn't mean it can't be done on something else but it's there's more support so to speak for that kind of thing so that's part of that's one part of the uh, the conundrum. The other thing, Kelly, is that one way I like to look at this, there's two ways, two broad ways to look at this. Say we got iPads for everybody, okay? Then everybody's using the same thing. Everybody, you know, pretty much familiar from year to year what they're using. And that's the, that's the solution we go with. And some school districts are doing that, and they're doing it well. Another way to look at it is, what is a, what is a second grader need compared to a ninth grader? And is it different? And if it's different, what makes it different? Is it, is it, what, is it based on how the teacher practices and it goes back? Everything's going to go back to professional development, by the way. Everything goes back to teachers teaching. Um, they're the most important thing 
between, you know, with it's the, it's the teacher and the kid. So there are a number of different models to look at. We should look at them. We should make decisions. We should vet the, the, not just the devices, but what the devices do and how the teachers will use them and how the teachers will be supported in using them. So that all needs to be discussed sooner rather than later um, so that we can make those decisions, you know, um, as, educa as educated as we can with the, the money figure and the direction of, of uh, schools. And I agree with you. And I think it's great that, that things, that maybe there is an assortment because it gives kids a chance because when they get out into the community or out in the real world, they may not be working on Apple, you know, iPads right. or whatever it may be. But I guess my thing is, is I just don't want to be sitting here in three years or four years and going, having you go, hey, now this doesn't print with this, and this doesn't print with that. Right. Um, and I realize it could happen, but I'm just saying is let's just, let's just keep an eye out for it. Yeah, that's, 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 that's fine. All. That's it, all. But keep, it, keep in mind, too, though, that, I mean, we really should consider every four years we should be doing, you know, spending another pile of money here. Ken brings up a great point. <clears throat> the, well, we have the, to define that pile of money. We can't just say, right. we can't just say right. we're going to spend another four years on a pile of money. Right. We need to define that through information that he's talking about, that I'm talking about, you're talking about, to know what is that number four years out based on what we're seeing now. It just, I mean, it's got to be teeth behind it. Yeah. Right. Ken brought up a great, he mentioned the, the pilots at the high school. The Chromebooks were being used by English teachers, uh, and an English teacher, I'm sorry, and she's very happy with how that worked out. They're ideal for typing papers. You know, they're ideal for searching the internet, find, you know, doing research and all that kind of stuff. They're ideal for sharing the, the documents that they create with their teacher and getting feedback immediately without printing it out, without printing it out, Rick. They're ideal for, you know, they fit really well into that environment. So now a whole lot of other English teachers would like to have Chromebooks. Same deal with iPads in, in the math classroom. The math teacher used it, loves it. There's another math teacher that wants to get a, you know, hopes to get a set, um, trying to find funding to, to get another set going in there. There's a lot of video that ends up being, uh, that happens with math. There's, you can do uh, the clicker system thing, you know, uh, it's a teaching thing, I won't, I won't go on with that. Uh, there, there's things that it, that it, it, it works well with. Then um, the, back to the virtualization thing and the BYOD. The th beauty about um, virtualizing things is that you can, you, if you can put the app on the device, then it's all, it standardizes everything. So if I, have my, I can put it on my Android phone and, and get my Word documents. I can put it on my iPad and get my Word documents. I can put it on my Chromebook and get my Word documents. I can have a regular computer and get my Word documents. You know, it's just, it just turns whatever the device is into a receiving machine, so to speak. So. And they all work. I, mean, I don't want to keep this one too far, but like that virtualization, I mean, with all the different manufacturers, they're all, we know, that, I mean, there's evidence that they all support off of this. We're going to buy one system, and all these other companies will accept this software and this information? Yeah, the, I mean, we've been working with, we've virtualized some things already. The, one of the labs at the high school is virtual lab. Um, about half the laptops at Monument are virtual. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> um, there are, uh, I forget where else. There are about 60 licenses, I think, that we have so far that, uh, that we're using virtual, virtual machines. I mean, I, I can get my desktop on my iPad through the virtual app on my iPad. So I can, you know, I can, if I'm wherever I am, uh, I can, I can get a, open a document, you know, any document. So we've got good information to start the discussion and budget with some additional that Frank will give. I'm just doing a time check and what I'd like to point out to you about the agenda is that items number four, five, and six really are the meat of what is coming next or, or the, um, will be uh, what we'll be concentrating on, what follows that will be uh, briefer. So I'm just uh, giving a time check, Wendy, to you and to Donna and the principals as we move forward to those parts of the budget and see if we can get through um, some of those by 9.30, you know, without, without limiting the discussion, but just to keep our eyes in line for the time. Anyway. Thank you. Okay, so I'm done? Yes. yes. Okay, <laughs> so you can look at the, yeah. look at the other comparisons and um, and get a committee started and have Jackie come and tell me how, how it works. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank Thanks, you. Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As Catherine said, we're uh, pressed for time because we do have to have a... Uh,
second okay. session sure. afterwards, and we want to get you know huh? kind of unfair to stay forever here. Okay, uh, four per change in contracted services with regard to new position requests. That would be me. Um, so as part of my new role, I've been trying to do some analysis of things that are going on in the whole SVSU, and one of the situations that's come up um, is a situation at Monument. Um, for several years, we've had inconsistent caseloads at uh, Monument. We have one special education teacher at Monument, and this year she has 18 on her caseload, which puts a strain on delivering the services that are required by an IEP. Um, when you have that many students, it's difficult to get around and deliver all those services effectively. We've been using SD Associates and hiring behavioral interventionists um, actually at all three schools. Um, so I think that tends to not build capacity within our schools. So what we really need is an additional special education teacher at Monument School. And one of the things that I've been um, considering is that um, that teacher needs to be PBIS trained. Um, to help out with the situation with the positive behavior interventionalist programs that are going on in the BSD. Um, so what I am proposing that we hire one additional special education teacher instead of contracting with the outside consultants for two of the behavior interventionalist specialists that we've been hiring from SD Associates. Um, so there's a, a little bit of movement that would happen with this so we could get the right kind of people into the right space. Um, the suggestion would be that we move one of the teachers from Bennington Elementary, who is PBIS trained, to Monument. When we do that, that person will be able to, will be able to split the caseload at Monument, allowing both of those teachers to service those students and do a flex room model at Monument School. When we do that, there are two paraprofessionals that we could move from Monument to Bennington Elementary to meet needs there to help support the flex room model and the student support center model that are already in place or are being put in place at Bennington Elementary. Um, the financial impact to the BSD board um, would not be one. These are positions that would be funded through IDEAB, so there would not be a financial impact. The current contract for the SD Associates, for each SD Associate that we would hire for the, be the behavior interventions <coughs> is 41000 each. So that's approximately $82,000 that we're doing to outside contracting. Um, when I put, we, Rick and I worked on how we could look at if we put in a new teacher at master's level 10 with a full family plan that came out to about $76,000. So we'd even be saving a little bit of money there. We'd be doing, what we could do with this program as the proposal is do some more trainings for paraeducators and we'd have the additional professional staff at Monument to provide the services that we need. Okay. The contracted services, you can break those contracts when you want, is that it? Anytime. Yeah, it's, well, it's a 60-day contract. Yeah, it's a 60-day contract that we can break. We, we haven't we signed, signed with SD Associates. Okay. We haven't signed right this second. Because right. I was hoping to come to the board and do this Questions proposal Questions, everybody? First. Now, the teacher that you're going to move from Ben L, is that a, a, a current teacher that's there that's already been established and that has students that has started the year? It is a current teacher. Yes, yeah, correct. And, and, and then I would hire another teacher for the position that would be left vacant at Bennington Elementary. And I've been doing some research. I have a couple good teachers that I think we could, that Mr. Law and I could interview for that position. And I just might add that Jim and I have been working with Wendy in regards to all of this. It's not a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think what it, I, and certainly Jim, and I, your thoughts, but I think what it does is it supports the needs in the separate buildings in different fashions. I really actually great pair educators um, that I know are are good, but in the capacity of needs in the each of the buildings, we actually do think it will be helpful. Good. So, so going back to the business of the 
We've got, I want to be sure I understand this. We have a teacher at Bennington Elementary School mm -hmm. <clears throat> who has already a group of students who the parents have met, who has started school, and we want to take that person out of that situation, move them, and put another teacher in. And I have some questions about that. I've got many questions about that. Mm -hmm. Are we, is that the appropriate what, educational way to go three days into school? Are you looking let me, let me put it this way. Or I... Well, let me put it this way. If it were my child that was in that classroom, I would have serious questions and concerns over doing that. Here I've been told all along who my teacher is going to be for my child. Three days into school, we're going to send a note home saying, oh, by the way, that teacher is no longer there, but we're going to bring in a teacher that we think is just as good. Is that educationally sound? As, as a brief answer, it's not the best situation. Well, that's what I'd like to the, talk about. It, I mean, it, it does create some of those issues, some of the relationships that have begun to build or strengthen or renew. Um, the point, however, that Wendy's making of building capacity within SVSU, there's a longer term benefit um, that we're, we're trying to generate. Um, in the best of all worlds, would this be the timing that we would do this? No, it, it, it wouldn't. But the, the circumstances of the information that we have, the funds that have kind of been available, uh, the people that are in play, so to speak. Um, it, it seems like it would be better to do it now than to wait two months or three months or wait a year uh, to try to uh, make it work at that time. And if I, if I could just add to that, um, the, I absolutely agree with everything that Jim said, but we're in a position where we need to provide services for students who are identified and these are part of their program on their IEP. So I absolutely bring up a very good point, but that's through a contracted service. So when you talk about establishing relationships, when we contract with an outside agency, we don't get to pick and choose who we're getting. So we're creating, um, what we're doing is we have to fulfill a service on an IEP. This is a way of building our own infrastructure with our own staff who we know have the ability to do it. We know how our professionals and we're not looking to the outside. So this ends up being a win-win situation for the SVSU, for, or for the BSD. Well, could, could, excuse me, can I just follow up and then come back? Yeah. I, would. I, I, I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. but is there not another route that we might take that would achieve the same thing? We're saying you don't want to bring someone new in to that, but why, why would not bringing in someone new and leaving the situation that we have there alone create less of a problem. And I think a little bit of it goes back to the PBIS, PBIS yes. situation. Yes. Um, there are two PBIS trained people at Bennington Elementary. Um, so the, the situation that we're creating, we're not taking away that PBIS training at Bennington Elementary, but we are creating it at Monument. So you don't that have we to do. do that at Monument. And I, um, well, and I, I would say it in this fashion. Um, when we looked at it from a helicopter view and the restructuring in order to meet the needs of all students, I have a paraprofessional who currently works as PBIS trained, not a professional, a paraprofessional, not devaluing her role, very good paraprofessional. But if, I, if we move to restructure and put the special educator in my building, as I said to Wendy and Jim, it would not be fair of me to want to keep all of those people because we're looking at how to service all. So when we looked at that, so you'd have to get rid of somebody anyway. we, we would transfer a special education para and the, and the student support center para to create the support and capacity for Jim and his needs. It meets both needs in the buildings. So we're using our staff better in regards to capacity. And our kids are being met, our IPs are being met, 
by our professionals, so we're looking at all of it. And we're not just taking the contracted service and writing the check every year. And the, we're building it here. And I think one other little point is that this, um, the position at Benel is not a, like a class, and not what you would think of as a typical classroom teacher. Um, this is the, the, the young, the teacher <laughs> that we're thinking about moving um, is in the flex room model. So it's not a class that you've got 13 kids going into every single day to be serviced. It's not like a, a first grade classroom <coughs> and we're, just, we're taking that teacher out. It's a flex room model. So some of those relationships, you know, really haven't formed because those students are, other, are involved with other teachers. How long is it going to take you to fill the position of Ben Al? Um, I, I don't, I, I anticipate that it won't take long. I've been re doing some research and talking to people already to find out their availability. And I have three people that I've already spoken with about um, a po possible interviews. So I I'm, I'm, would anticipate that it would not take us a great deal of time. And are we looking at PBIS training still? Is that still the criteria, still the... the, the background that we're looking for? No, I mean in the new hire for Ben L? Um, I don't think that was part of it. Since we already have a, a person, another person besides the person we're removing who is PBIS trained. And so how are we gaining the capacity then? Oh, Where's the capacity prepare. gain? At Monument. Other than just in the building itself the, you're gaining capacity. The, capac you're gaining the, the capacity the gain is within our BSD district because we're not looking to, to spend our money outside our district. We're building our capacity in our district, and we're able, with this model, to serve all of our students through this model without contracting out and writing the check out. If we don't think of this kind of model, we will need to contract out to provide those services. Uh, yeah, we'll have to, to do that. For, for some students. And I think one of the ways that we're building capacity is that we're going to be able to provide more training to our people. Right now, SD Associates comes down. They train the behavior interventionist they have. They don't train our people. So they just train their people, their people do their jobs, and then it's done. Whether we keep them for five years or, or they leave, we're not getting any training or you know, building up of our staff members from them. It's just they come, train their people, and leave. So we're shifting, if we were to go along with this, we're shifting one person out of Ben Al to Monument, two pairs out of Monument to Ben Al, and then we're going to add another teacher there. What happens then when that teacher's added? The new position is actually a monument. No, no, no. It's at the, the new position is at Ben Elm, and that is a regular special person. educator position. I, I, I yeah, yeah, let me let me backtrack. Um, we really try to keep track of the position position control, just because we're moving that teacher. Um, themselves and reassigning them to Monument. The new position is really at Monument, and the right. basic uh, vacancy for special ed will be at, at um, Ben That's right. Yeah, we, we, we've got to keep our positions tracked. At Ben Right. So. And I think the other thing is the caseload reduction. Um, we're really trying. We heard from parents when I went to talk with parents. We heard a lot about the need for. Um, more collaboration time and more time to actually attend to not just the service of the students but the actual written work that has to happen for quality in the IEP and the notifications and by lowering the caseload we start by evening out the caseloads we start start to move to that so that was the other piece I think Wendy probably mentioned at the beginning so what happens to the budget after we hire the next teacher what, where does that become funded? The replacement, the new position in special ed at Ben Al. How does the budget get affected at that point? This year it does not. This year it does not because uh, it's funded out of IDEAB. Um, I think past practices you have funded some, when you've done some, moved some position out of grants, you've funded them into the next fiscal year. Um, I think that's analysis that we will do to see if that's what, how we want to go to fund it, if we need to really fund it into the next fiscal year, the fifth. And we want to make 15. sure it does what we think it's mm -hmm. going to do. What was the cost number? Right now it is. Um, cost cost generally correct, but, uh, although the direct answer to the question is 
that position at Ben L is funded through the BSD Resource Room and will continue to be funded through the BSD Resource Room. The new position at Monument um, is funded through IDAB grant, a special ed grant um, that is currently paying for the contracted services. So that's the position that's going to be grant funded. The position at Ben L will be continue to be locally funded. What what um, Wendy was referring to is. Um, in general, the IDAB grant is um, is used for capacity itself, and um, I encourage, and our, our past practice has been, to have flexibility in that grant, so that if you know a high need student moves into any one of our districts, because that IDAB grant is spread across the entire issue. Mm -hmm. um, we have capacity, financial capacity within that grant to say, okay, this high need student in Bennington, we can cover them for the rest of this year. Maybe a residential placement somewhere at $300,000 a pop. Um, but then we have a conversation with the board is what Wendy was referring to, the following budget cycle to say, we had a hiccup, we were able to cover it through the grant, but now we have to plan for this thing from a budgetary standpoint going forward. Um, We'll probably have that conversation next year about this anyway um, in the budgetary process. But in this case, it's actually cost neutral and actually saves money to the grant because, you know, when it is about 81000 so it's going to be about $8,000 savings to that IDAB grant. In either case, it's not affecting BSD. The effect to BSD is staffing levels and what you want in your building. And um, to summarize it, just because I'm a simple person, is um, you are increasing one professional staffer going to Monument. You're transferring two pair of professional staff into Ben L. So that's as simple as you can say it. That's, that's as simple as you can say it. So my, my last question, my last concern or worry would be, and I think that's why we're having so many questions, because we go off a... Uh, what an interesting school year last year. You know, I say we just come off of. I don't. It doesn't feel like we've had summer break. Are we going to be operationally sound at Ben Al? And is it? Are we? You know, in particular that school, we've got many conversations, been, been a lot of public conversations here from from uh, parents and different things. Um, are we going to be sound there so that we're not going to fail in some areas? You know, I mean, anything can happen, but I want to make sure that, yeah. you know. Do we have to do this before we have the new hire available? You know, I mean, because the, yeah. the same turmoil is going to get created. And that, was gonna, that was going to be the other thing I was going to, somebody mentioned earlier, that was going to be the other thing. And my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Wendy, is nobody moves until a new person's hired. Right. So, I mean, we're not, we're not going to move and create a hole somewhere until we have an extra person hired to create that capacity. Am I correct? And also, I think just to note, because I don't know if it came out in the discussion, the um, flex room model um, was one that started at Molly, what, two years ago? Or, yeah, yeah, two years ago, and it's been very successful in helping to respond to immediate need of interventions. And um, we're implementing it now at, at um, Ben Elm. We've actually uh, allocated space for that, and um, in this uh, scenario, it will be implemented at Monument. How long of a time frame, Wendy, for the new fire? I, I really, um, I, I think, you know, um, we've already been talking about a couple of the people that I wanted to interview. If we can get those interviews started immediately. Yeah, I would need an, uh, permission to do a letter of intent to hire rather than waiting until you're a month from now. Do you want a motion? Yep. So moved. Second. All in favor? What's the motion? Okay. <laughs> 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 I think agree, to, agree to the staffing reorganization. I think yeah. we have okay. to do the motion to, to agree to that right. um, new yeah. position and then intend to hire. Right. Yeah. That's what we said. Okay. That's what we said. <laughs> but now I've got, a, I've got a question in regards to this before we do this. I, I don't have any problem with, with it. But are we going to come back and look at the candidate prior to, or are we giving you the okay to hire? Because I want to see what level this candidate may come in at before final approval comes right. in. Right. Well, that's the difficulty in, in the timing then. Um, you know, we can have a special.
special meeting. Uh, other boards have done it. Um, the SU board this year decided uh, not to give uh, uh, authority to the superintendent for a letter of intent to hire over the yeah. summer and have a special. This is an issue position. They're not going to give you the authority anyway. They're just going to authorize the hire. They're going to authorize the hire. That's right. Thank you, Frank. So, but what I'm saying to you is, you can have a special meeting to, um, to authorize. Uh, it's a, because it's special ed. It's an SU decision. Thank you, Rick. Um, so, but my point is that you can have a special meeting if you don't want to give me um, the authority. Um, to move forward with um, an authorization um, without seeing what, what level they come in. And by level, you mean the salary and experience level. And it's a contract, it's a collective bargaining uh, agreement position, so it's a union position. Just a like we would be the hiring board, though. No, you're not, you're, you're, you're no, you're not, you're not you're even. So I mean, we can see it, but it doesn't matter what we really say on the matter. You're, well, you're, you're authorizing. This is part, and Rick can help me with this. But this is part of the governance structure that makes um, our moving to respond to student need quickly very difficult, mm -hmm. um, because all of the special ed services, uh, services and uh, hires, the employment hires, are through the SU board. The SU board is the hiring board. You need, and I believe you need to know who's in your building, but also what you've gone into a practice of doing is authorizing that person to be in your building. We try to time it so you get to see that before the SU meeting. It's not always possible. You've got one right here on the consent agenda today that's already been approved by uh, the uh, SU board pending your authorization to have her in the building. So it becomes very tricky. Rick, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, I mean, it's complex yeah. of government. I mean, in, in reality, to be perfectly blunt, you have no authority in this conversation. Now, right. by practice, as Catherine has said, we all like to have a, Same. you know, hope, hope, hope that we're all, you know, adults in the room and have a, you know, a constructive conversation. And what we've done by practice is to have the local boards authorize the positions and authorize the hiring. So, you know, and, and the SU board has been very good. And actually, George has is, 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 is probably been the most, <laughs> yeah, most you know, turning to one of the other districts and they, you know, Shaftesbury, you okay with this hire? And, you know, how are you comfortable with this person? And, and, and it's worked well. Uh, for the most part, but there is timing. timing there's issues. there's timing hiccups. That and take when you're place. trying to respond to student need, it takes if you do it in the regular sequence, it takes two months. Um, so the motion is really to authorize the position. Right. SCSU has to create the position. Right. Which we'll do and we just, we just did. We just did. We just did. Okay. So you authorize the position. We got a vote. Oh, we got a vote. Vote. vote on. Okay. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, reassignments for your own uh, information. FYI. Three reassignments, FYI. Consent agenda, next item on the... Uh... So moved. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. On the consent agenda? Yes. Uh, I guess I'd want a, an executive session. I have questions. If we're talking about individuals, are we? I think we are. Well, if you talk about specific individuals, specific individuals, therefore, in. I will recommend. I want to hold it. I want to hold it. Mm -hmm. Do you want to hold it until executive session tonight? Do you, Do you want to pull, you want pull the nominations? Pull the nominations. Right. So remove the. Okay. Nominations. Can we have a, a motion for the minutes and the warrants then? So moved. Okay. Second. Got a couple of questions on the warrants. Okay. We have a second. Okay. No questions. Okay. Um. On the warrant, there's a uh, gasoline for Davy Oil. Um, Diesel we get from there. Okay, it said gasoline on the warrant. That's why. Probably just a mistake on I'm right now. That, that, it, that's probably just the uh, descriptor of the account that we charge it to. Right. Is my guess. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't want to get it. doesn't sell gas. It only sells diesel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't um, sell gasoline at all. Well, that was part of my question, why it was on there is yeah. gasoline. Um, then Kraus Livingston, um, it looked like the bid that came in for that, it went over bid by a little bit. Any particular reason? 
Well, well there's three projects, right? It was bid, well, the, the, the bid that we were given was 18423 on the capital improvements at BS, or at the Monument. We talked about that last meeting. Yes. And it was a problem with the, uh, when they start digging, there was a... Uh, erosion you asked some, that some question, you got an answer no, last night. Answer. Yes, we did. Yes, we yes, did. did. Jack, yes, uh, it is, because Jerry answered it. Jerry answered it. Answered it. it was the, when, once they started digging, there was more that erosion. Was that was the pavement. That was the pavement. That was the pavement. But there was a, you answered it. Well, anyway. Well, he's here. I didn't realize he was here. Okay. Then he can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you're talking, the one that you're talking about, there's a couple of different bits that were on there. The one for 18 something is for a project that we're still in the process of doing. It hasn't been completed yet, so um, I'm not sure. You might be one, you might be one check, but they've done a couple of projects up there for us. So it be all it would be all the three couple of projects that's been. So it's here three projects. It was a kid. It was it was it was two sped uh, one sped room one sped room and then the and then the uh, oh you know part payment of the you know the oh okay the door the wall yeah they're not over there I don't believe I'm not aware that they're overbid on the no they on the yeah. most recent project that's in your package. <laughs> Just when we, we when we put do a warrant, we put all to one vendor. If you had a vendor that you had four projects with it, five okay, projects. So is that eighteen four twenty three that we bid? Is that all three projects? No. No. That is one project. Okay. So I guess how can we track through the warrants then for what's being paid for when that particular project is done? I don't know if you would be able to track it through. Uh, the warrants. Um, I don't think you would see that from your warrant schedule. I can give you um, an update of where that project is. I believe. That project is the 11635 portion of that payment. But I'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Seeing none, then uh, all in favor of the consent agenda, which includes the minutes and the warrants. Okay, now uh, educational matters, regular and spend, and then what we take it. Try to keep it very brief, and I'd be very happy to come back and talk to this another another meeting when you aren't here so late at night, right, George? Uh, uh, we just want—I just wanted to follow up a little bit and say that our professional development sessions at the beginning of this year have really um, helped us to move along uh, in looking at data analysis for continuous school improvement. And I just want to commend the principals here and other administrators who have really. Um, committed to going to many workshops. They started already early in August and mid-August, and the, the, the different sessions we had last week were especially for administrators in looking at student data, the um, MAP data, really looking at it as educational leaders in their building, how to run data teams with their staff so that they can focus on uh, individual student progress and how to differentiate instruction. And they're, you know, it's early in the year, but they're all really looking at how to implement some new assessments that we will be doing in an ongoing basis for progress monitoring. And we'd be happy to come back and tell you how that monitoring is going and looking at student growth this year. So I think that we're, we're well on our way. Maybe um, yeah, Jim and Jim some of the principals would like to speak it. to that. But we've had some really great experiences um, helping administrators really look at the data that we have and the tools that we have that again linked to what Frank was presenting in our 
in our technology tools to really access that data so that we can use it efficiently. But I just wanted to introduce that topic, and like I said, I would be happy to come back and bring can it up again. A question? Sure. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's to you or whatever, but I, I you know, through the, through the professional development, I kept hearing, and, and you mentioned a number of times, that there would be special education, autism, professional training, all of that sort of stuff. But yet, as I looked through the list, mm -hmm. I didn't see anything on there. Uh, there were quite a few sessions for special education. I think our major uh, accomplishment was looking at goal view for all of the special ed staff members, so that thoroughly um, took their, uh, their time that we had as uh, SU days. And then also there was a significant uh, session on Friday for looking at all of our focused monitoring issues and how we were going to move forward in addressing all of those needs. So there was no specific training in regards to autism and special education? It was looking at what was currently in place? So uh, what I asked no. Wendy to do, and she can comment on this, is that we have a number of vendors who are available to do training in autism. What I've asked her to do is, as we put this autism support team together, or support team for students with ASD, um, is to gather all of our uh, special educators who are trained in autism and this team to sit down with her and look at the vendors to make sure we're tailoring that uh, professional development with these vendors. Uh, specifically to the needs of our students. So I've asked her to do that and put that together. We were not able to do that this summer because we wanted to make sure that we had as many of the hires, the positions filled. We were delayed in some <coughs> of the positions being filled um, because of lack of applicants. Um, but I think we're well on our way now and she plans to do that. We still have that money that you set aside um, in your budget um, and the FBSU level to use for that. So that's still there. Um, and we want to make sure we do a good job. We'll be uh, um, also checking with parents about that as well. So, <coughs> leading off, leading off from that, so when is the next opportunity for that? Well, they'll figure that out with the... Um, no, I mean, the calendar is the calendar. You know where the windows are. Where is the next window well, that you're going to capitalize for autism? Because we just had the greatest window of opportunity. We have had a person in the interim in that role assessing and helping going along down with the needs within our school district. So we had input, we had ideas of what maybe we needed for training. We could have done a self-assessment and just, I just don't know if we didn't have some of the information. I mean, I know Wendy's new and she needs to get her feet wet, but Donna's been in the process of being in, from in, the, in the position supporting the no, needs I'm, of the issue. I, I'm going to take full responsibility because my priority in working with the uh, uh, consultation with the uh, position, the um, sessions that were offered was a review of special education law and paperwork. We are um, in needing of that refresher for all of our special educators and we did that and that was the highest priority. Um, and I will stand by that as being the highest priority for those first days. We needed to get in and really review all the paperwork, especially as it re relates to compliance issues and quality control and how it's going to phase into Goldview. And I really wanted to get this team together, um, which actually is on that. your agenda today, before we venture into that specific training. Um, now, we have had training in the past. We've had um, New England, um, New England Center's done some for regular ed teachers last spring uh, through the Title I grant, interestingly enough, that was allowable as a strategy. Um, but we want to make sure that we're tailoring it to the needs of these students and it's important to get the new team right on board because they're going to be the ones that are giving service as well as um, consultation to regular classroom teachers and special educators. So they need to be there. We need to look at all these vendors. Uh, Jerry uh, O'Connor attended the Cotting, Cotting Institute mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. and um, we're very familiar with New England uh, Center and, and know the kind of training they bring the Howard Centers and others. So we really um, we really want to make sure that we're, we're putting that in. And what Wendy is um, planning are um, meetings of the special educators um, that we're, she'll be gathering and we'll be looking at their scheduling with the principals to make sure that, that, that those times are, are um, taken out of, you know, are taken out of the day without taking them away from service. We're trying to reserve 
as they schedule their service sometime each month, that the special educators can come out and be with Wendy. And she can divide that how she wants. She can pull just those uh, um, special educators that are working with students with ASD. Uh, we can pull in some substitutes to cover for uh, regular ed teachers or overlap that after school within the time that they spend. So we will do it. I think once that team meets, we should come back with a plan and show you exactly where it's being given and, and who the vendors are and what needs um, it's being addressed. But that money is still there. It's still reserved for that. And I do, I just want to reiterate that there was quite a bit done last year, and right. it's a very individualized approach. It's not a one-size-fits-all, so we did have a consultant that was here working, and she's still here on a weekly basis to work with classroom teachers on very specific issues they would have in their classroom uh, to to improve the their own performance and to make the curriculum more accessible to all students. And we, we've also done... Um, one significant hire um, for BSD that is someone that has experience um, with students with ASD considerably. So, um, you know, we were pleased about that. We're really trying to um, build up that capacity in our hires as well. So I'll take responsibility for setting that priority during the first well, day. Well, I'm just saying, you know, his impression was that we were going to do some specifics to that. He was surprised not to see it there. We know no, that it's a very hot topic and hot button. You know, we just sat here since six o'clock this earlier this evening till seven thirty for an hour and a half talking about, you know, goals and visions and missions and stuff like that. And we identified that we're, you know, best way to get out of crisis mode is to try to put in your best offense. You know, but I the mean, other so. thing we're seeing is like lack of compliance for paperwork, um, quality control there. The, uh, you know, that's been loud and clear from the teach site. I had to get that in. I had to get it in when we had the. Uh, availability of the state person. We also, as a result, uh, which are not on there, we also have compliance <coughs> issues that we have to give professional development for, uh, meant to be annually, um, that we're actually offering uh, by computer online that we couldn't fit into the first week. So <coughs> those are all being done as well. But I think, um, you know, I like I like the interest in saying that's a priority and, and actually the accountability of coming back and showing how it's how it's going to be done. Uh, Catherine, are there any things that are online that are available for the board so that would oh, sure. give us some uh, background? <coughs> That's a great idea. For all sure. The the time time of stuff. Sure. And, and I know a lot of my teachers have been doing that independently, mm -hmm. um, already doing like the webinars and the, the web programs that they can do online. So they've been doing that a lot independently so and so bringing that information. Yeah, we can do it for the uh, compliance issues as well as special ed and autism. Sure. And actually that online uh, for the compliance training has many, many um, different um, different workshops that you can, there, there is one on autism and there is one on yeah, behavior management, there is one on any topic that anyone would them. want to look at. We, have, we are only using about four of them for our, our policy-based uh, webinars, but we, there are many more that you can access if you want information. So, Thank you. Yep. For the special resource support team. Actually, I think I just did that report okay. today. <laughs> Wendy, Basically, I <laughs> All right. Basically, I could I could, <clears throat> could just update you on one thing. We have hired an SLP. Um, what I did was Julie Hopp was on the um, ADOS team. I reassigned her to the autism team. We hired Rachel. Tip Litsky. Yeah, she's um, on yours for authorization. Mm -hmm. Tip Litsky. She's, she's the BCBA. Um, she's a, a certified school um, psychologist, um, and we're gonna. I'm gonna work with her about getting her certification for the BCBA, the Board Certified Behavior Analyst. Um, I have not yet hired an OT. I've put out. We've been advertising. I haven't got any applicants. Um, I've put out letters to Russell Sage and Saint. Mm -hmm. Um, Rose. St. Rose, thank you. And um, I have also have a, a line on a couple people who said that they would be interested in contracting with us, so I'm going to be contacting them um, over the next couple of days. And then um, I'm also going to, on a hot tip, um, look at some of the schools down south who are, have big occupational therapy um, programs that I'm going to be looking at them and putting out some feelers for them. Wendy, can you clarify something for me? Yes, sir. The, that team. Yes, sir. Can you define what that team is going to do? Um, I can. The purpose of the team is to provide direct services um, 
So huh? the team is going to provide direct service. They will be to providing all ASD students. Well, some are in. Yeah, I will. I will not say to every single ASD student. Like you may have student A who does not need a direct service from one of those members. They're getting their direct services from someone else. Um, but student B may need a direct service from that particular SLP because there are other SLPs within the buildings that will be providing some services. Um, so I would not say to all ASD well, students. And we also have a self uh, resource room, mm -hmm. self-contained mm -hmm. categorical resource mm -hmm. room that Program. they would not be involved with because the intent there is for students in the mainstream. So the direct services training, consultation, um, working with like the general education teacher and the regular education, the general education teacher and the special education teacher, um, support for anyone who's working with ASD students. So this is like the what I would consider like our expert team who can go around and not only do the direct services because I think that's going to be a huge part of it, but help train those other people who are working with them to also give direct services and provide the supports they need to. And what will uh -huh. define whether that. ASD student may or may not get direct services from that team? Um, I think it'll be uh, um, a team decision um, with an IEP team or a. No, no, this the ASD team. Okay, team. that's what I'm asking. Yes, the ASD, not the, yeah, the ASD, not the, yeah, not the IEP team. The ASD team. So, like, um, when we, we've already formed a, the kind of caseloads of all the students that we're thinking are at all the buildings, and we're starting to review those and see which ones are. The, need, the ones that we need to start doing the direct services with and then how to transition those services to other people or in, within their programs. Or, so we're already starting that process. Thank you. You're welcome. So, not to go too far, but uh, the last meeting we were here, you were redefining and redeveloping new sheets and forms that were going to help. How did all the staff take those new forms? And are they out yet? Um, some of them are out. Um, some of them we're doing revisions on. Um, they get like I, I put them out. They gave me some input back, so we're we're doing some revision. Um, everybody's been pretty open, I think, to what we were doing. Um, I think they they they're seeing a um, a progression because the the forms that we're working on, the forms that we're redesigning, are adding more information than that we need to to move forward and making some of the decisions that we're making. What are some of the revisions that you're doing? Like, what, can you give some examples of what come back? Like, what are some of the forms? Yeah, the forms, your revisions, you put them out there and then you get the feedback and then you're revising them. What, what, what are some of the things that you're changing? I think, like, changing? Clarif um, wordsmithing, for one. Um, clarification, like, if, um, if I asked for, um, a, if, like, on a referral form, if I asked for why the student was being referred, they, um, some people said, can we break this down some more? Is there an academic reason for referral? Is there a social reason for referral? Is there a behavioral reason? So I think it's like the, the wordsmithing of forms so to make things it, clear. To yeah, to make things clearer. And faster to fill out, mm. I would think. Yeah. And I think the, the Goal View um, program will help us do some of that because some of the things that we have to do within Goal View will help us create better forms that we need. Okay, moving along, uh, the next item, uh, no policy, so forth, SVSU board meeting, just a quick update. Uh, the PLUS program is now called On Point. The Baton Kill, uh, doing the financial uh, part of it, the contract was extended one more year. It was, um, just a clarification, we're in our second year of the two year. Yeah. Uh, superintendent search, uh, Sean Marie gave us the name of three different uh, groups. That she's looking at, they put in uh, requests for, I don't know, call them bid, but it, interviews, and we're going to be interviewing next Thursday, the 12th. Uh, opening day, uh, there was a nice article in the Bennington Banner there, and I want to thank the principals and the paras and the uh, teachers and the custodians, everybody, for a fine uh, first day opening, according to the uh, article. So it was uh, very good. And, uh, just under chair's report, sign up October 7th at the CDC. There's going to be a regional uh, meetings for school board members, and Lake Maury is going to have the uh, annual meeting on the 24th and 25th of October. You can see Mary Lee about that. Uh, and I'll be uh, getting back to uh, Steve and uh, setting up another date where he can come in for some training separate from our regular meeting. And I'll make sure that the uh, days are sent out and you can select 
uh, convenient date so we can all meet again. Uh, most people thought that was a good exercise that we did this morning. This evening. Mm -hmm. This evening. Sometimes. Sometimes. Like <laughs> <laughs> I, just, uh, I just have a quick uh, I have another. <laughs> update on enrollments and attendance. We're checking our infant and campus um, recording of those that um, we had enrolled to those that actually attended, so we'll get you out a uh, finalized uh, list of how many students in each class um, by class, uh, and I'll send that out by email, and then we can also post it on the website um, for public. Um, but um, I think I just wanted to share some observations with you that um, we continue to have population shift in the um, population in Bennington throughout the summer. So we ended up with some late uh, changes to keep to that uh, class size. Um, um, so I ended up approving some students right before school started um, to even out class sizes. We've, we have uh, walk-ins at um, Molly and Benel and actually at Monument as well. And so we right now are placing those students and looking at those students. Our class sizes in uh, kindergarten through grade two are within your policy, so they're looking pretty good. Our, our, they're from um, 15 um, through um, uh, 17, 18, right where we wanted them. Uh, some of that was uh, able to be done by some combination classes. Then uh, we ended up uh, creating a 2-3. Um, that's my next uh, good segue into my next comment. Our greatest uh, Bubble, for lack of a better word, is at grade three. We have more students at grade three, um, uh, which has caused the uh, change change at Ben Allen. We're watching um, Molly Stark at grade three. Um, at Monument, we have 27 in grade three. So grade 26, I'm sorry, it was 27, it's now 26. Um, so um, that really is where our pressure is. And then our um, fourth and fifth grades are all coming in. Um, basically within your um, uh, 18, 19, um, up to 24. So again, within your policy. Um, we're down, um, I think I saw we were down um, across the uh, supervisory union about 100 students. So we're still tracking where that all is. We lost quite a few second graders too. We're not quite sure why yet we're doing that analysis. So we'll get you those final numbers. We, we still have, as I said, some walk-ins that we're still placing. Uh, that happened today, so uh, we'll get you those out. That was. Yes, please, Karen. Um, we wanted to also give you an update very quickly, and it's a handout on the Act 62 preschool um, partner programs. Um, I had an, I had announced some of the um, numbers at the SBSU meeting, and they've already changed. It's an ever-changing total um, right now. The deadline for enrollment is September 13th, and the reason why we can go to September 13th is that public pre-K is 35 weeks, and if we um, enroll by the 13th, we'll be able to meet our 35 weeks in the school year. Um, on the top is the numbers as they currently exist, and again, they're ever-changing. It seems to fluctuate between 175 and 180 that we've enrolled. People move, are still moving. We're seeing the fluctuation in moving in and moving out. And I made a list of all our partners that we have. And when you look at the Head Start, the list, um, where it says Shaftesbury 2, North Bennington 3, Panel 1, that means the number of classrooms that have children in them that are partners. Um, so we have a lot going on. I think the most exciting thing that you might want to hear is that over 80% of these families have a completed registration packet with all of the parts, Yay. with all the parts and pieces, and the other... And this will help our enrollments as they move That's forward. That's right, because oh. we have agreed as an administrative team that we will promote these students and only ask families for updates, so we won't have all the hassles that we have had in the past trying to deal with our kindergarten numbers, particularly in Bennington. The other 20%, we have packets, and um, but they may need pieces. But 80% of them are complete, and as soon as the 13th hits, we're going to stop the enrollment process so that I can do the budgeting that we need to be able to make the financial agreements with all of our partners. But I don't feel I can do that until we hit the deadline of um, 
the last enrollment. We want, we still have openings, so if the banner could promote that we're still having, you know, Bennington, uh, we're still having public pre-K openings. Um, our partners, um, Oak Hill and Farmhouse Nursery School. Um, oh, I inadvertently left Happy Days Preschool, Happy Days uh, Preschool up here. That's, um, I'm so sorry, I will add that on there. Um, they have openings. The Early Childhood Center had some part-time openings. So we still are accepting students. We'd like to get the numbers up even higher if we can. Um, but I think we're off to a really good start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you to everybody for the yeah, hard work. If you look at the clock, it should give you an idea that we cannot do everything in one meeting anymore. No, I know. And, and this is the second and third time that we've been until 10 o'clock. CSD needs to go back to well, two Well, report to one hour the bar. But we are asking for that stuff all the time. So you were saying back to the two meetings per month? Okay, can we have a motion to go in? I got, I got one other. other okay. and I don't know if it goes to, to, to you, Jim, or to Jerry back there. Um, there's a net in Ben Allen uh, in the gym that I know that's been requested multiple times to be taken down due to, number one, the teacher's not certified, number two, the balls get stuck up behind it all the time, and actually from that side, the basket is not available to shoot a basketball. Any reason why it hasn't been taken down? He's I don't want it taken down. That's one reason. Okay. Uh, it's been requested. Uh, just because the current uh, PE teacher may not be using that doesn't mean that that position may not change at some point. Right. In, uh, we can't, and then have someone come in who would be loving to have that equipment because it is uh, um, challenging equipment that promotes uh, adventure skills for kids within the building setting. Um, so is there any way that something could be done maybe to raise it up a little higher so it doesn't affect the basketball or put something in the end so not as many balls in the end? Is there anything that Jerry could look at? We, we could certainly can look at that. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Just don't, forget any, going executive session. just don't forget in your executive session you have the nominations you need to add. Yeah, you're right on top. Motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? That's great. Unanimous. Contracts and, and uh, student matters.